Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. A message from our sponsor, Curtis Brown Creative. If you're an aspiring author, you'll be excited to hear that this week's sponsors are Curtis Brown Creative, the renowned writing school affiliated to the major literary agency. Since launching in 2011, over 160 of their students have gone on to get major book deals. CBC run a wide range of courses covering a variety of topics and genres. If you're interested in bringing history to life, why not join their six-week online writing historical fiction course with exclusive teaching videos, resources and writing tasks from best-selling author S.J. Paris. By the end of the course, you'll have written at least the first 3,000 words of your historical novel and developed a plan for the rest of the book. Plus, all students will be given the opportunity to get individual feedback from one of CBC's expert editors. Visit www.curtisbrowncreative.co.uk to find out more about all the courses on offer. Curtis Brown Creative have provided an exclusive discount for Always Take Notes listeners. You can use the code ATN20 for £20 off the full price of writing historical fiction or any other four or six week online writing course. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and I spoke with the historian and novelist Antonia Fraser. We spoke with Lady Antonia about her first hit book on Mary Queen of Scots, about her research process and about her new book on a 19th century campaigner, Caroline Norton. It's a great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome Lady Antonia to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Could we start with your latest book, The Case of the Married Woman? How did you come across the story of Caroline Norton? And could you give a sort of brief pressy for our listeners? I wanted to do a book about a law trial, centred on a law trial. I've always been fascinated by the law. And I think if my life had been different, I think I might have been the most brilliant barrister. And actually, oddly enough, I have a son-in-law who is a very distinguished QC and a son who is a QC. So my wishes have been fulfilled. and I remain fascinated by the law. Anyway, I dimly heard about this trial of Caroline Norton. I really knew nothing about it. And my granddaughter, the daughter of the great lawyer, um, was reading for the bar and she wanted to earn an honest penny doing research while she was reading for the bar. And so she looked online for me. I mean, she looked, researched and came up with the whole trial. And I'm infinitely grateful to her because the moment I read it, it was a sort of newspaper published report, sort of Tutney report of 1836. I thought, this is for me, this is the most incredible story. And, um, you know, I don't know if you found it so, but I found it gripping. And that's where it all began. And could you tell us a a bit about some of these bits of kind of pioneering legislation in in the early 19th century and how they they fitted in. So is it particularly the the 1839 Custody of Infants Act, which is in some ways the first ever piece of feminist legislation before Parliament? Yes, um, I'd like to explain what the trial of 1836 was, because it's relevant, highly relevant. Caroline Norton was sued for adultery. They called it criminal conversation in those days by her husband with the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. And there was this steamy trial, but the end of it, right or wrongly, they were found innocent. The judge found them innocent. Nevertheless, legally, George Norton, her husband, chucked her out of the house, took away her three children under seven, and lived off the copyright of her books because she was a writer. Now, where I would have lain down and moaned, Caroline Norton. Um, brilliantly and wonderfully started to campaign, not only for herself, but for other women, for married women, for women to have rights of access to their own children. And that led up to the Infant Custody Act. Before that, a woman could give birth to a baby in marriage and have no rights over to see it at all. In the introduction to the book, you talk about writing you know, with one eye on the past and and avoiding bringing contemporary values and attitudes into into the book. How do you actually achieve that on the page and how tempting is it to sort of insert some righteous anger? I think it's tremendously tempting, but I think one's got to be honest. I feel I'm on my honour. When I am giving way, I say so. I have a special phrase 
is it fanciful to speculate that? To which the answer, I can assure you, if you ever come across it in my books, is yes. <laughs> but uh, I, I never state as fact what is my speculation. But inevitably, we're all the subject of our own time, aren't we? I mean, my attitudes towards um, women's rights are different, even from those of my mother, although we were only 24 years different, because she was the first generation where young women voted. You remember in the, the first suffrage was women of a certain age. Um, so we had slightly different attitudes. So I think it's very important to remember that, that different social upbringing, different attitudes, but the same emotions. It's equally important to remember, you know, hate, junk, jealousy, love, pride. These are universal. And I think between the two, you know, reconciling the two, that's the art of biography. I saw this other phrase that, that you've used before of being a, a liaison officer between the past and the present. Could you, could you unpack that idea, particularly with regard to the new book and maybe some of these ideas of changing mores? Yes, I, I like the idea of introducing people to the past in a way that would make it alive. It can never really be alive, but make it alive to them. I pay great attention to the sort of detail of my characters, the sort that I want to read. I mean, I think part of my good luck of being a writer is that by nature, by instinct, I know what ordinary people want to find out because I want to find out it myself. And that's very helpful. Um, and I love investigation. You know, I always try to go to places and see them you get something from it, a sort of feeling. Sometimes you get rather important information from going to a place, but it's all part of trying to give reality um, to something which once was real. That's a perfect segue, actually, to talk about your research process. Obviously, with this book, you had a little bit of help from a, from a grandchild. But in general, where do you start when you're undertaking research for a book? And how many books will you try and read? How many trips will you try and take in general? And how do you organise all that material? I have two sources of research to start with. One is the British Library, which I've been working in the British Library, um, wait for it, for 67 years. I worked in the old British Library at the British Museum when I first worked for a publisher, George Weidenfeld. And I work now in the what was once the new British Museum. It's a great place. And then there's the London Library. I'm a member of the London Library, and they are wonderful people. I mean, for instance, during lockdown, they ran a postal service, without which I think not only me, but lots of people have been absolutely stuck. Those are two sort of great founding stones. And then it's wherever the manuscripts are, again in lockdown, archives around the country were very helpful, photographing images. And in some ways, if you're looking at a manuscript in handwriting, obviously, it's rather helpful to have something that you can peer at, look at upside down, sideways, get a magnifying glass. <laughs> if you started treating an important document like that in an archive, I think you'd come to, <laughs> I think you'd be ejected, <laughs> understandably. So. Um, Lockdown in that way wasn't all bad, you know. But I, I mean, I love looking at handwritten manuscripts, preferably very well handwritten manuscripts. I curse the people whose handwriting is not good. <laughs> but it gives me a sort of thrill, you know, this, this is what she actually wrote. And of course, if you're writing about a subject, you get to know their handwriting, like you get to know your best friend's handwriting, and it gets easier. Could we roll back now to to the beginnings of your interest in history and and in writing? Is it is it correct that as a child you would create genealogical charts, including one that began with Mary Queen of Scots? And I also read that you you were influenced by Our Island Story, which you you read as a child. And I was wondering perhaps if you could explain to some of our listeners who aren't familiar with that book what what that is and and what influence it had on generations of British school children. With pleasure. Um, I was a very early reader. I was taught to read by my mother, a very clever woman. And in those days, when people like her got married, they didn't necessarily work where she'd been in 
lecturer at the Workers' Educational Association in Stoke-on-Trent. So she had nothing to do, do, nothing to do better than teach her first child how to read. So I was reading by three and a half, um, lucky me, and I was still reading. Um, and I have a copy that I was given, actually it, it's here, but uh, of our island story, my, by my godmother, um, Opera, and it says, Antonia Packenham, her book written by me, Christmas 1936, when I was four and a half. And I was just blown away. I thought, this is it. This is what, what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell stories like this. And it was quite helpful that um, we lived in Oxford. My father was a don in Oxford Castle, where Queen Matilda escaped over the snow. You know, I could imagine myself escaping over the snow, particularly as the first, you know, the early winters of the war were very cold. But I think, you know, I had no inhibitions. Mary Queen of Scots had four little ladies in waiting called Murray. No, she didn't. She had five. One of them was called Murray Antonia Packham. <laughs> you know, I think it's a marvellous, I was so lucky to have my imagination excited in that way. And they're all there, the stories. Anyway, the author, um, H.G. E. Marshall, was actually um, a woman living in Australia, and she told the stories in Our Island Story, which was not Australia, um, to, because she was immigrant and wanted to tell her children what her home history was. Um, it went through a patch long after my childhood when it was thought to be, um, you know, perhaps imperialist, shall we say. To me, it, it's a work of imagination and excitement. And I was very happy to write an introduction to a new version, I mean, a new edition. But I don't, I, I mean, as long as children read, I think their imaginations choose for themselves. But I shall always be grateful to that book. As well as that book, was there a particular interest in, in history books and sort of stories set in the past as a child for you? Yes, that's absolutely true. And, and particularly heroines, I think. Did I have any heroes? No, that was when I was, when I was a teenager, I started to have male heroes. I started to read Georgette Hare. Have you ever read Georgette Hare? I haven't, but I'm familiar with, with what she writes about, yes. And I was wondering what your mother, Elizabeth Longford, was, was also a biographer. To what extent do you feel you were taking up the, the family trade, as it were, and also that your, your daughters have, have followed in this path as well? Well, it's a very odd thing that people find difficult to believe, but actually my mother wrote her first biography when I was 35 and had five children. And my addiction to biography was nothing to do with her. All through my childhood, my parents were politicians. They stood for parliament between them three times. And she only took to writing, I think Queen Victoria, a great book came out when she was 60. So although it's very difficult for people to accept that it wasn't post hoc, proctor hoc, it wasn't. As to my daughters, will you forgive me? Uh, I let them speak for themselves, which <laughs> they're fond of doing. <laughs> and they will either tell you that it was a nightmare having a mother who wrote history, because one of my daughters did tell me this, because if she got good history marks, they said, just like your mother. And if she got bad ones, they said, what will your mother say? Anyway. They're both, in my estimation, brilliant, scholarly and hardworking. I'm sure they'll be pleased to hear that. Am I right in thinking when you went to Oxford, you studied PPE? My mother, um, who, was a bit, who I adore, was a very strong influence on me, um, said, don't say you're going to study history. And I said, but I am going to study history. It's all I want to do. She said, no, you put down PPE. I said, why? She said, well, then you'll get a scholarship because girls don't put down PPE. Oh, so I wrote down PPE. I never thought of asking what it stood for. And Julie got a scholarship. First day in the junior common room, somebody said, what are you going to read? I said, PPE. I said, could you tell me what that is? And they said, philosophy, politics, and economics. I think, where? And the first lecture I went to, which was, I think, philosophy, but there appeared to be some numbers on a blackboard. 
was a very distinguished don. I played screaming back to Elimate, Lady Margaret Hall, my college, and said, I want to study history. And they said, if we'd known you were going to study history, we wouldn't have given you a scholarship. So I said, yes, my mother said that. And then because they were very decent women, all women, you know, just as we were all women students, they said, OK, as you didn't know, we'll leave it. <laughs> and what was the Milo like at Oxford in the 1950s when you were there? Is it right that V.S. Naipaul was a contemporary of yours? A exact contemporary and a great friend and remained a great friend until his sadly early death. And then when you went after graduation to go and work for George Weidenfeld, what was that experience like? And where, where did Weidenfeld fit into the kind of publishing landscape at, at that time? That was a most exciting experience um, to work for George, as I did for three, min- three years until I got married the first time. Because George, in some ways, was really my university. But I'd been brought up in Oxford as the daughter of a dog. And although I was delighted to be there, there was no excitement. I knew all this. Whereas George, coming from Austria, refugee, self-made, wonderful, spoke every language, and was full of excitement. He used to come back to the office with a new book or a project for a new book. Um, he was an extremely nice, genial person, um, never ticked you off. He just looked rather pained. Um, that was the worst that ever happened. And I remained devoted to him and a great friend. And in fact, Weidenfeld and Nicholson has published nearly all my books. And you'd said that publishing had always been your plan. Your mother wanted you to go into the foreign office, which would have been to the country's detriment, you said. Um, what what was it about publishing that, that appealed so much? Well, it took me towards writing, you see. And, um, I mean, she sat next to... My mother sat next to George Weidenfeld, who said, do you know any girls who speak eight languages, have good staff skills, shorthand typing, and goodness knows what? My mother said, yes, my daughter Antonia. And George told me afterwards, he was rather surprised he didn't get a list of seven, you know, Anyway, it was the luckiest day of my life, really. And how how do you feel about how publishing was then compared to it is now? The fact that, that now it's much more the, these small independent firms that existed in, in the 50s and 60s have amalgamated into huge conglomerates. And do you, do you feel that something has, has, is that a loss or a gain? Or how, how did the landscape feel different compared to how it is now? I don't quite agree with you because I know um, I, my book, case of the married woman has just come out in the United States from a small publisher um, called Pegasus. Um, and I know of, I'm in one world where San Carter, who I mentioned, works it, 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 and pu- published my book, or Israeli Diary. They're not a huge conglomerate. I mean, they may turn into one, but they're not now. I think um, the coming of the internet and everything, I think they're more small publishers springing up, even as conglomerates conglom increasingly. But you you might know more about it than me. Could you tell us a little bit about what that first job in publishing was like? You're sort of described as an all-purpose assistant. And I read that one of your first assignments was to extract the expletives from Sal Bellow's The Adventures of Augie March. I'm not sure if I've pronounced that correctly or not. But what kind of tasks were you, were you given at that time? One of the first tasks I was given was to extract the F word um, from the adventures of Augie March by Saul Bellow. And um, apparently it was publishable in the United States, but not in England. And it was explained to me that I left in one effing F, (laughs) then Weidenfeld would be ruined by prosecution. And years later, I rather proudly told Saul Bellow this, we were on the Booker Prize committee together (laughs) <laughs> he didn't look a bit pleased as I introduced myself as the person who took the F word out of his novel. <laughs> but otherwise, um, I wrote copy. I did a lot of editing. Um, I'd be dispatched to work with famous people, just needed the book editing, alternative description, writing, you know. <laughs> and that was very interesting and sort of good for me, I think. I was very lucky. I think 
for someone who wants to be a writer to write and to work in publishing is the most helpful. Could you tell us a bit more about these your own writing pre Mary Queen of Scots? So, um, is it right that your your first book was King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table in the nineteen fifties, and that you also ghosted Christine Dior's memoirs? Well, um, but to take them different order. Um, George Weidenfeld had a contract with Marks and Spencer, the heirloom library, and he, we would publish classics, thus paying no copyright, you see. And he, he used to come back with a list of what we were to do. And there was a meeting and he said, and now we'll have King Arthur. And I saw my charts, clever clogs. Oh, you can't have King Arthur because Mallory, no child could read. And T.H. White is, you know, is in copyright. And George just said, oh, you, Antonio, you will write it. Uh, so that was my first book, which I wrote in the evenings. I'd like to say after nightclubs, but I didn't actually get asked them in AI clubs. I wrote in the evening and I was paid £100. And I loved it. It, it was, um, and the other day, very distinguished person, Charles Moore, you know, found a copy in a church bazaar. It was published in 1954, um, talking about a church bazaar. So um, I felt honoured. <laughs> that was my first book. Then I did Robin Hood, similarly. Then I did two books about the history of toys. I was married by then, and I saw all the toys. Because I, I can't help it, you know. I must start writing about things. So. Um, I dedicated my history of toys with the four names of my then children who first inspired and then impeded the writing of this book. Um, and then one day um, my mother came to see me having published very successfully Queen Victoria, wonderful book, and said, oh, my agent suggests I should do Mary Queen of Scots. And I went, oh, froze with horror and then sort of said, you can't. She's my Mary, Queen of Scots. She said, all right, then. Well, I'll do the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> and so then, you know, I went, got a contract with George, a lovely agent, and I set about doing it. And now, I'll be honest, it seems to be rather extraordinary because I did have another child. And so I was pregnant in the British Library, strong anti-recommend of trying to take out the albums they had <laughs> if you're pregnant, not the way to go. Um, but, it, it, you know, I wanted to write it so much that I did write it. And it came out and to everybody's astonishment it was a great success. I was lucky I hit the spot. How did you juggle having young children and doing the research and writing in a kind of practical sense? Well, they tell terrible stories. They say I had a notice on the door saying, only come in if you've broken a leg, which I strongly deny. What I did have, I'd have my work hours, and it's still sort of in my brain. If I don't work in the morning, I feel odd. I, I, once they were in their cradles, creches, kindergartens, schools, I then worked like a bat out of hell until lunch. And that was it. But if you work for three, three, hour, three and a half hours, with no telephone, I'm not talking about mobiles, but putting the sound off, no interruptions except <laughs> accidents. It's amazing what you could do. What do you think made uh, Mary Queen of Scots such success? We often, we have very distinguished writers on the show and they often find it very difficult to explain what concatenation of factors has led to a, to a book to really break out. But I, I also saw in... Um, another interview that the, with the proceeds of the book, you were able to buy a heated swimming pool at your lodge in Scotland. Is that, is that correct? I built it. You okay. can't buy a heated swimming pool. Sorry, that's the correct term. I wish. Well, because we sit there. Yes, I mean, but we just had a little stone house, lovely. Um, and then, because I'm mad about swimming, and then suddenly this money came. I'd never had any money. And... Um, I built the, the pool. I believe it's still there, though the house belongs to on board. But it, but I, I think we'll leave out the first 
interview I did on the radio, I was being taken in a taxi to Broadcasting House by the publicity person from the publisher. And I said, I hear it selling very well. And she said, yes, I think it's the subject, don't you? And I thought perhaps she doesn't have a career in diplomacy ahead of her. But I think that the subject um, and the lucky, the time people wanted the Butler Education Act of 1944 had just come into full cycle. People wanted history that was readable and they found my books readable because I think I, I, I know what ordinary people like because I like it myself. So I think it was a combination of good subject. And then, you know, there I was in, with my false blonde hair, my white miniskirt, that was considered to be fun too. <laughs> For someone who was clever, I was quite pretty. For someone who was pretty, I was quite clever. I think all of that worked together. <laughs> um, how much had been written about Mary Queen of Scots before you undertook this biography? Yours is now seen as the definitive one, but was it daunting entering into this, this field or, or did you know that you could contribute something new? I'd like to say the latter, but actually um, there was one terrible moment in the London Library when I realised that the books I wanted were perpetually being out and I began to realise it might be to some other person and I absolutely panicked and I asked the librarian who it was going to and he refused to tell me. And I, I experienced frightful panic. And then some sort of ice cold feeling took over and I thought, well, um, as Saul Bellow would say, <laughs> I'm going to do it. Um, this is my Mary Queen of Scots. And, um, and so I never felt that again. By the way, I should say that there's a very good Mary Queen of Scots since mine by John Guy. And what has your interaction with academic historians been, both at the time of Mary Queen and Scots and, and since then? And has there been a, a difference in how your books have been perceived in the United States and in the UK? Yes. Um, well, answering the last question first, I think in the United States, credible luck. Uh, Mary Queen of Scots, the publisher, tried to reject it, um, saying it was rather academic and scholarly. And I went on a, was not allowed to, and I went over there and was sort of the fourth on the interview list on television, you know. And then something happened and people found well, I think it's the readability of what people actually want to read. Maybe I, the person I think about is the reader, but it just hit the spot and unbelievably it became number two on the bestseller list. Nobody could believe it. And do you know what the number one was? It, it was everything you've always wanted to know about sex and never liked to ask, which made the most wonderful <laughs> entry for me for making a speech, you know. <laughs> The first you asked something before. Oh, academic historians, how they, how your relationships and interaction with them have been. I think it was helpful to have been brought up among them uh, uh, because my father, as I said, was a Don and to know Dons in the sense that I, I sort of knew what they were like. They were very generous over Mary Queen of Scots because I think they all thought the other one would give it a bad review. I'm very ungenerous over my next book, Cromwell. And one academic said, what has this nice, kind, middle-class woman got to do with the tumultuous values of Oliver Cromwell? And I was able to say in a lecture, um, first of all, I'm not nice, and I'm not kind, and I'm not middle-class, <laughs> and I will say what I like about Oliver Cromwell. But I, all the prejudice which had helped me with Mary Queen of Scots hindered me with Cromwell. What's a woman doing writing about battles? And that's 1973. So they, they, they were comfortable with you doing these books when it was seen as sort of a women's topic. And then as soon as you ventured into war and civil war, it was not seen as a fitting match of subject and author. Yes, in a way I understand, because after all, I was apt to say that I understood Mary Queen of Scots because I'd had a child and she had a child, it's rather important point in her life, you know, that she has a terrible experience while she's pregnant. So if I say that I can understand it the way a man couldn't, I suppose I'm asking for it. 
if a man say, I can understand the battle because I fought, but you can't. It doesn't, um, now, at my age, it doesn't matter to me at all. I mean, when I wrote about Charles II, you know, or Guy Fawkes, nobody seemed to mind. Hello, it's Artemis, the producer of Always Take Notes. I hope you're enjoying Simon Rachel's conversation with the brilliant historian and novelist Antonia Fraser. It's time for the next instalment of our segment where we share bonus material from previous guests of the show. This week we hear from the CEO of Hachette, David Shelley, on a time in his career he failed. One time that comes to mind was when I was first promoted into a sort of more management role and I was frustrated by uh, the fact that some of the books weren't selling as many copies as I wanted them to and I decided to start a new meeting where basically I put all the salespeople on the spot and just asked them on a very granular way what was happening um, with each book and you know what the orders were and why the orders weren't higher and things Um, and it quickly became a I would say a very toxic meeting. Uh, the sales team hated it. Uh, it's, it did achieve results in that, um, in that, in that things, you know, we, we got more orders for the books, but someone took me to one side and said, you, David, you really need to take people with you. Um, and I, I did a 360 as well. And someone in the 360, their feedback was David's a fun person, but he's not a fun person to work with. And I thought, okay, you know, I can't be so single-minded about just wanting to sell books. I have to take people with me. I have to be, I have to be a lot better to work with. So, so I, I learned from that that this is a people business. You can't, you can't just impose your will on things, um, and you need to, you need to really respect everyone as an individual and take take everyone with you. That was David Shelley. And if you'd like to hear more from David about his career in publishing, you can listen to our full episode with him via our website, which is www.alwaystakenotes.com. Now back to Simon and Rachel's conversation with Antonia Fraser. At this time in in the 1970s, this was also when your relationship with Harold Pinter began. Could you tell us a little bit, which you've, you've also written about. Could you tell us a, a little bit about that, but also about how it works as a relationship of writers? Is it correct that you would sometimes, you would listen to his work and that there was a that kind of creative interaction between you as well? I'd love to think there was a creative interaction. I think um, I once, Harold always used to act his plays when he'd written them to me, which was wonderful. Um, I'd be sitting where I'm sitting now, Whatever. I only once made a suggestion in 33 years, at uh, which point <laughs> he went angrily walking around Holland Park, came back and did put in another scene, but it wasn't the scene I'd suggested. It was a completely different scene. So I'd, I'd got the gap right, but I'd no idea. But I mean, compared to that, he was extremely helpful to me because he knew no history, his words. And, but adored language. Language was his love, you know. And so he'd notice when I repeated words. I hate, I fall in love with words. And the word, shall we say, sanguine occurs twice in every chapter. He's very good at earning that out. At the same time, he'd say, who is Robespierre? I mean, that's a slight exaggeration. And I'd say, oh, everyone knows who Robespierre is. He's, I don't. And then I'd explain. So it, it wasn't sort of creative interaction action so much as we were both being created by I mean, him much more totally creative and living very happily together. It, wor- it worked very well because there was no possible rivalry between us, you know, unlike with an actor and a playwright. Beyond that attention to language and the craft of sentences and things, is there anything in general that you think a playwright could learn from a biographer and, and vice versa in terms of narrative or, or anything else? I'm afraid I don't. I think the biographer can learn from a playwright a sense of drama. I also learned something that I wasn't a playwright because I, 
everything Harold wrote was dramatic. It just sort of came out dramatically. If you write a letter or an account of anything, um, not so me. You know, I'm constantly wondering what's what's really happening. You know. um, so I think I learned from him. I think the first book I wrote when we were together was Charles II, and I think it has got a sort of fluency, perhaps, of living with him. But uh, Harold was a, a one-off for Sue I Generous. I don't think he learned anything from my books. <laughs> what was it like being, when, when your relationship was beginning, being in the centre of this media maelstrom and this was it was all over the papers and and things like that what was I mean you'd, you'd been in the public eye with your books before but what was that period like well it was uh, looking back on it now it seems absolutely extraordinary two middle-aged people went to live together so what you know we weren't sort of Prince Han, Harry and <laughs> Meghan I mean uh, very odd um but um and I, I think I mentioned it briefly in my memoir, Must You Go? But the point is that the very, the truest statement ever made, I think it's by Chateaubriand, possibly by La Rochefoucauld or Coca, is living well is the best revenge. And whatever happened to the people who wrote the stories, mostly untrue and some of them racially rather unpleasant, whatever happened to them, Harold and I had an intensely happy union for 33 years. So, you know, who cares about a few gossip colonists? It's a long while ago. Could we talk about your memoir, which you just alluded to, um, of your time together? When did you decide that you wanted to write that? And how did you find the process of writing about yourself versus writing about someone else? I wrote Must You Go Under Extraordinary Circumstances. Harold died on Christmas Eve, and a month later I was given a condolence lunch from a nice friend, um, and he said, Antonio, do you still keep a diary? He was just trying to keep things going. I said, what? Thank you so much for lunch. That was a real pleasure. Goodbye, see you soon. And I ran home, and I got out my diaries, and I began writing almost immediately. And I wrote it in six months, and it was my morning. It, 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 I don't know how I would have been without. I, uh, it's very gratifying to me that, um, even though it's now been out for about 12, 13 years, um, people, it's a rare week or two, I don't get letters and emails from people who've been helped by it in their grief. And that wasn't why I wrote it. I, I wrote it to help myself in my grief, but it gives me great pleasure. You mentioned um, just now that some of the, the kind of coverage in the 1970s had a, a sort of racist, or I suppose, anti-Semitic tinge to it. Do you think that that would be different today? I mean, how could you explain how, how you perceived that and how, how that sort of element affected you? Um, I had my first encounter with it when I worked for George Weidenfeld, uh, who, who was course, 100% Jewish. Um, and it was very odd for me because, you know, I was a child of the war. And to me, the horror of what had happened to the Jews, I couldn't believe anyone could be anti-Semitic. I lived in a society where a lot of people were Jewish, a lot of people weren't Jewish, who cares, you know. So to find people making anti-Semitic remarks about George was both horrible and extraordinary. And anti-Semitic remarks about Harold. Well, um, he grew up in the East End. It was used, used to it. I just thought it was absolutely awful. And when addressed to his marvellous, dignified parents, I still get angry. Could we change tack a little bit to talk about your crime novels, um, which followed Jemima Shaw? Um, they were published across several decades. When did you decide that you wanted to write those and how did the, the research and the writing process differ from writing history? Oh, it was completely different from writing history. I was in a hotel with Harold. He was, I think, directing one of his plays in New York. I had nothing to do and can't had nothing to do. So I picked up my um, pen and wrote the first lines of Quiet as a Nun, a Jemima Shaw novel. 
And I loved it because I'd always been mad about reading crime, Dorothy says, you know, it's Agatha Christie, my heroine. And so I, I wrote it. And then it was, um, the first one was made into a, a little series and later it was a television series. And uh, I had fun. Um, I haven't written any, um, the last one I wrote was before I wrote The Gunpowder Plot, which was history. And somehow writing a history of a plot occupied that bit of my mind, which wants to write criminal stuff. But I never say never. The only thing is Jemima Shaw, my heroine, was very smart and chic and sort of eternally 38. And I knew exactly what she'd wear, marvellous sort of white trouser suits and things. And if I was to write about her now, I'd either have to make her sort of Dame Jemima Shaw, my age, um, or I'm going to be 90 in August, which would be rather a bit, possibly a bit old for a sleuth. Or I'd have to do so much research with my granddaughters. I mean, I've got 14 granddaughters, but they'd sort of have to come up with, um, if you wear a white trouser suit and you spoil ketchup on it, do you take off the trouser, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, so you'd have a writer's room ready for you to bounce ideas off. It'd be perfect. Well, I, as I say, I, I, I don't, I am sometimes asked about it. I don't. Um, Ever. Never say no. A question we often put to historians and nonfiction writers in general on the podcast is how they go around or go about organizing their research material, their files and, and this huge mass of, of material that they amass during their research. Do you have a, a particular system that you've evolved and how does that work for you? I have two. I mean I get a great believer in writing things down, you know, and well, I have card indexes, actual cards for subjects, um, the sort of thing that probably people now do online, but I have card indexes, boxes, and then I have files. And then I make, when I've reached a certain point, I do structuring, struct, struct time. And then I structure the whole book. I take about three months and make a chronology. Um, I mean, it may sound wearisome, but then I've got a marvellous structure, you know. Um, and then I hope to just write it all the way through. It's never quite like that, but that's the plan. Okay, so you prefer to have the kind of book mapped out in your mind before you start writing? Because some writers sort of find a bit of research, write a bit up, and then kind of build it, build it up that way. Very good writers, but I think... The kind of thing I write, the kind of history I write, it wouldn't really work to do a little bit because we don't really know the picture until you've got the whole picture. But I mean, I know good writers who would disagree. And in the the life cycle of of one of your books, what? How much of the time is spent researching, and how much is spent writing? And then, what is the edit process like once you have a a draft? Um, research, I would say. Average two years, oh, or maybe three years, and writing between one and two years rather depends. Um, Marie Antoinette, because it was a different language, my first book about a sort of foreign person, and I spent a lot of time going to France researching. It took longer, sort of thinking myself into the French habit. Um, Gunpowder plot, uh, shorter really, because it was so important to keep the narrative. Um, so it, it varied a bit. And then once I've done it, got the whole narrative, then I put in the references. Um, and then I give it to an editor of whom I've been very lucky for the last four books to have an editor at Biden Folk called Lucinda McNeil, whom I'd like to pay a tribute. And I think good editing is invaluable. Is there any overlap between your projects if you're doing research and you stumble across a, a great nugget that you think might, you know, form the basis of a book? Do you put it to one side and think I'll come back to that later? Well, not really. I mean, there could, there well could be, actually. I'm just trying to think if that's true. Because 
you see, I'm, I, I spent a lot of time reading history and I'm not actually writing about other history. Um, I do get ideas, but um, the thing about an idea with me, it's got to be special. If I get, it's like marriage, you know, it's gonna last, it's got to be special. Um, I generally, oddly enough, they've generally sort of come like that. Um, sounds rather strange, doesn't it? Although one or two have been suggested, the six wives of Henry VIII, I was working on something and my American editor, Robert Gottlieb, said, you may think this is a very stupid idea, but what about doing the six wives of Henry VIII? And I said, Bob, that's not a stupid idea. That's an idea of genius. So I owe that to him. It's a rule of the podcast that we always ask about money and how it has interfaced with people's writing lives. So, so be as candid or as guarded as, as you're comfortable. But, you know, since you, uh, you dug a swimming pool on, on the proceeds of Mary Queen of Scots, how has... How has 54 years ago. Exactly. How, how has that worked <laughs> since, since then? And how, how has it worked financially for you? Well, I, I've earned... Uh, with Mary Queen of Scots earned... Well, I had no money and suddenly I had money in swimming pools. I mean, obviously, some of my books have sold much better um, than others. Marie Antoinette sold well, Six Wives sold well. I mean, they've all sold enough, you know, earn their advances. But then you have bits of marvellous good fortune when Marie Antoinette was bought for a film by Sophia Coppola. Have you ever seen the film? Yep. Uh, I loved it. And that was uh, financially, obviously, they buy the option. And then people go to the film and sort of buy the book. But it was altogether a lovely experience because she's such an interesting person. But anyway, getting back to money, um, I mean, you know, I have six children um, for some reason need education. <laughs> um, I've never, um, and I've had very good luck in life, which is I bought the house I'm in for £18,000 freehold in 1959. And it's now worth untold wealth. <laughs> and it was just luck because I liked it. So I've never, I, I, um, well, as Nanny would say, muscle grumble. <laughs> We're coming towards the end of our time. So I wanted to ask about um, verses, verses to Please Myself which was published in 2021. Um, why did you want to release them? You said that you've, for your whole life, been writing sort of little verses, um, as the title suggests, to please yourself. Uh, why, why show them to a, a broader public? Well, I tell you, that was particularly, it was during lockdown, my granddaughter, Atlanta, and her fiancé, Eric, had their wedding cancelled three times, which was really, um, I mean, they're, incredibly happy married a couple now but just so painful you know all the preparation and everything I hope nothing like that happened to you and, and um so i wrote a poem a, a verse i mean um called moon wedding it's the last one and then sam carter has a a private little privately printed list you pay for it it's not very expensive he makes it look beautiful makes it look like W.H. Auden, but published by Faber, you know. And I dedicate it to them just to cheer them up. But then a um, wonderful thing happened. I gave a copy to John Gillooly of the Wigmore Hall as a thank you for something, did me a great favour. And he showed it to Stephen Huff, composer. And he composed four of the verses as songs. And they were sung by Kitty Waitley, the Wigmore Hall. I couldn't believe it, me, you know, having songs sung. And they are now part, you know, you could get them. I went to somebody singing them the other day. That's my little verses. And that, uh, um, I mean, I think of all the wonderful, unexpected things that happen, little things. I think Stephen Huff composing the verses. They're called Lady Antonia's Songs, Swish. <laughs> A final question from me would be that as a biographer of, of monarchs and of, of sort of powerful people, what are your thoughts on, on top-down versus bottom-up history, on, on writing about um, potentiates, kings, queens versus 
uh, looking at economic forces. And I suppose your, your idea of the, the role of individual agency in history, that, that kind of Tolstoy question, how much is it a study of great men and women and how much of, of wider forces? Well, start at the end. If you don't get the great men and women right, you won't get history right. You know, if you start writing about Cromwell as a member of a ducal family in Northumberland, you wouldn't get very far with understanding um, history. It absolutely wasn't. Actually, I wrote one book called The Weaker Vessel about women in 17th century England. Um, and that was fascinating. The first day I came down to lunch with Harold saying, I'm in despair. It's 52% of the population for 100 years with no nice beginning and no decent execution at the end because I was so used to people having their heads chopped off, which makes one who into a book. Um, but I did try to read everything written by a woman. And of course, I, I was looking all the time uh, for women of what we might call the working class, where they couldn't write poor things. Every now and then, I'd find one. Excitement, you know. I love doing that book. Well, look, Lady Antonia, thank you for a fantastic conversation. It's been wonderful to hear about your extraordinary career and wishing you all the best with with the new book and with with all your other projects thank you very much simon and thank you very much rachel that was the always take notes interview with antonia fraser her new book the case of the married woman is published by weidenfeld and nicholson she's not on social media and she doesn't have a website we wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. If you pledge $10 a month, you also get a free two-month trial to Otter, worth $26, alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note-taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organising interview material. Thanks again for supporting Always Take Notes. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what was your takeaway from the interview with Lady Antonia? I liked her comparison of an idea to a marriage. You have to be really sure about it before, um, before diving in. It does seem like one of those careers that was predestined. When I was doing my research, I came across the... Uh, those little details such as the diadem that she wore to her first wedding which was based on the one that Mary Queen of Scots wore and things like that it seems like she was always going to take on that subject I wondered whether perhaps more we could have uh, we could have broached the subject of her writing routine um, but otherwise it was a very enjoyable um, and entertaining interview I thought how about you? I really enjoyed her disclosing how she had excavated a swimming pool with the proceeds of her her first book, which I think in our tradition of money candor in, in Always Took Notes is fascinating. I also thought it was great to have someone, you know, at, I suppose at that stage in her life who could give such a, an insight into what the British literary world was like over the, the six decades, I suppose, in, in which she's been active and how that, you know, coming into publishing in the 1950s, what it what it looked like then and also someone who was I suppose so embedded in in an entirely different firmament through her relationship with Harold Pinter as well which I thought she she spoke mm. very interestingly about so really delighted that we got her on the show anyway Rachel what have you been up to <laughs> mostly focusing on not melting in this heat it feels like a very British thing to complain about but uh both Simon and I had an absolutely awful night's sleep uh, in the heat wave yesterday. Other than that, when, from the safety of the air conditioned office, I've been um, working on a profile of a comp- an entertainment company. Um, so I'm hopefully doing the interviews for that this week. So that should be good. Hopefully it will come out in August. How about you? Uh, yeah, also a lot of heat avoidance uh, at this end. <laughs> um, remembering when I used to work in West Africa and reactivating some of the techniques and tricks from then. Yeah, and otherwise just doing um, getting with some magazine stuff together and, and stuff like that. So it's been... Um, it's been good, but yeah, looking forward indeed for the uh, weather to break. <laughs> oh, and it was also my my birthday, my birthday yesterday as well. So that was um, a, a small but significant moment. <laughs> anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikum. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our score is by Jess Danheiser. And our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Twitter at Take Notes Always. We're on Instagram at Always Take Notes. 
If you'd like to follow us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, where and always take notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.